Hi, everyone. My name is Kashish Kalwani. I am also a student at Emory University doing a master's in development practice. It's very lovely to see all such young faces here, and we are so excited for all of you here. Um, before we begin the session, we want to set an intention for what the session looks like today. What can you do as a single person? Do whatever you can. If you can plant a tree, do it. If you can reuse and recycle a plastic bag, do it. Little by little, if everyone does this, change will come. And if nothing else, then let's pray about it. We will be able to create a unique atmosphere. If not in the world, in this room, in your family, and in your community. So why don't we experience it right now? Starting from this room and this community right here. I invite you all to very softly and very gently close your eyes and settle down comfortably in your chair. Take a nice deep breath. And if there's any stress or any tension in any part of your body, simply find it melting away. You can scan yourself from the tip of your toes to the top of your head. When you find yourself relaxed, very softly and very gently, bring your attention to your heart and feel the presence of love and light present in your heart. Take the idea that everything around me is absorbing peace the sky, the oceans, the trees, the people, wildlife, buildings. And everything is radiating peace. Let your heart ooze love and joy and feel the entire conference being surrounded with it. You are a source of peace, a source of love, and a source of light. Now, very softly and gently, you can open your eyes and observe how you're feeling now. Did that feel good? Thank you so much for participating. Well, the intention is now set. I will now like to invite Michaela Coach and all our other wonderful panelists to take the session forward.
Is this on now? Yes, it is. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, I will quickly introduce the session, and then I can invite the panelists on so you guys can sit down for a bit longer, if that's all right. <laughs> um, so this is going to be a live podcast episode that will be uploaded, uploaded later. Um, just saying that because I'm about to say some things that might seem a bit weird to be saying to you. But um, hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Yikes podcast, the podcast about all the things that can make us yikes, all the things that can seem really overwhelming in this world and make us want to run away from them. But instead, we say that we have to lean into the yikes of the world around us. We have to lean into these overwhelming and big issues and transform that fear into action together. So today we're doing a live podcast recording at um, COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh. Um, we have some incredible panelists who are going to be coming on and talking to us about a topic called From Resistance to Power. So how are youth all over the world challenging power structures and systems and creating a better and transformed world tomorrow? It's important for me to say um, that we acknowledge that as we are doing this panel, Allah is in prison and we call on the UK government to free him. Um, I mean, I call on the UK government to free him and, and the Yikes podcast does. Um, I now want to introduce um, our fellow panelists onto the stage. Um, if you could please come on and then everyone will introduce themselves. Is that all right? Clap, everyone. Woo! Um, so this panel is going to be about how youth are challenging power structures all over the world. Um, we are coming at this from a principle called climate justice that I think sometimes gets misinterpreted, but climate justice is a principle that sees that the climate crisis is about liberation for all peoples. Um, it's not just about trying to make the same world but green, but instead about how can we transform the world completely, how can we look at the roots that have caused this crisis of colonialism and capitalism and other oppressive systems, and instead create a transformed and better world um, for everyone. And that is really within um, our grasp. I think that why youth are so important in this is because what is talked about as almost a um, weakness or naivety of youth um, is, um, well, when people say the youth are naive, um, I see that as a huge strength because we realize that everything that's been made in this world can be unmade. Um, and everything that we see around us is just the result of different people's imaginations. And so um, it's important for us to challenge these things and realize that we can build better things ourselves. Um, so without further ado, I will allow our panelists to introduce themselves and I will start with Ray. Oh, and I am Michaela, everyone. Hi, I didn't introduce myself. I'm a climate justice activist based in the UK, but from Jamaica, Ray. Uh, hello, I am Regina, but everyone call me Ray. I am a Mexican climate activist with an anti-racist, decolonial, and feminist perspective, and I am part of the Asamblea Ecologista Popular in Mexico. Um, Eric? Hi, everyone. I am Eric Njiguna, Youth Climate Justice Organizer. I work with Fridays for Future MAPA and Fridays for Future Kenya, and I am a COP27 Actions Coordinator with 350.org. Happy to be here. Mitzi. Hello, everyone. I'm Mitzi Janelle Tan. I am a climate justice activist with Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, or Fridays for Future of the Philippines, and also with Fridays for Future International. Hi, guys. Hi. The energy looks down. Hello. Um, my name is Aisha Siddiqua. I am a land defender from a tribal community in northern Pakistan called Mochiwala, and I am also a climate and human rights advocate. Thank you all very much. I'm really excited to be having this conversation with all of you, you all people I respect so much. So to inject a, a, some energy into all of us, um, let's do a very brief chant before we continue. So I'm gonna say, what do we want? And you're gonna say, climate justice. And then we're gonna say, when do we want it? And you're gonna say, now. Okay, are you ready? Is everyone ready? What do we want? Climate, climate justice. justice. When do we want it? Now. now. What do we want? Climate, climate justice. justice. When do we want it? Now. now. And now everyone outside is wondering what's going on in here and they want to join. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so to start off, I want to ask all of you, as this is called From Resistance to Power, what has resistance looked like for you? Um, Ray, you're okay to start? Yeah, sure. So I think resistance 
Uh, for me, in my context, I'm, I'm a woman of color from the Global South, and I see resistance in the indigenous people in my community who are resisting to extract the best projects and being in the front lines. But I also see resistance in community, in making mutual aid, in when we all gather around and go to the same fight. Also, I find resistance in all the powerful women who are uh, advocating for women's rights on my country on the front lines also. And I think I find resistance in every youth that is against the system and every person that opposes this like capitalist colonial system with their bodies and with their own existence. Eric, what does resistance mean to you? I see resistance in existence. The fact that we are um, from the global south, from um, communities who are affected by the climate crisis, but um, we are still activists, we are still standing up and raising our voices. Um, that means so much um, to me, and I see resistance in existence. Um, I see resistance also in a lot of, um, um, right now, for instance, um, in Kenya, there is an ongoing drought putting millions at um, severe risk of the climate crisis, of, um, of a drought. Um, I see um, the IMF launching austerity measures that um, have, uh, have, have led uh, ma so many sectors from education to health uh, to um, agriculture underfunded. But I see young people standing up um, against um, underfunding universities. I see uh, women who have historically risen up and uh, um, resisted against institutions like the IMF and launched protests and uh, stuff like that. I see resistance in so many things that um, people, people are doing in a country that protesting is not safe, but they still put their lives on the line because they know what they're fighting for. Which one of you wants to go first? You are. <laughs> For me, I see a resistance in caring for one another, in love, in community. I see how small farmers and small fisher folk and indigenous peoples are environmental defenders. They fight because they care for their communities, because they love the land, they love the ocean, because they know that it gives back to them and that they are a part of it. The Philippines is one of the most dangerous countries in the world for environmental defenders and activists. And that is because the world that we have today has forgotten that love that we need for one another. Um, I'm gonna answer this question a little bit differently uh, because I had the beautiful privilege of growing up in a tribal community for the first eight years of my life. And I learned resistance through, through the river that runs through my community through the glaciers that are a few thousand kilometers above, and through my people who, after so many threats of extinction, are still here. Um, most people don't know this, but Central, Amer Central Asia is home to the most number of indigenous tribes in the world. Um, countries like Pakistan don't recognize their indigenous peoples. The United Nations has asked it multiple times, I think 80, I could be wrong, and the country refuses. But uh, the Indus people and the Indus River is as old as civilization itself, and we are still here, we are still alive. And the way that resistance um, further became even more topical um, was because multiple communities in Pakistan experienced flooding. Um, there are some people in the audience who can also attest to this. During the flooding, um, the way that resistance manifested itself was, and, there, and the people in this room were involved in this, was young people got on their motorcycles and drove through flood zones where the military and the police and the government could not and brought grain and rice and tents and 
menstrual pads to women. Resistance was uh, people losing their homes but still getting up and making tea in their shanty towns in Pakistan. Resistance was that we as a community came together even when the international community forgot about us. That's so beautiful from all of you and yeah, thank you all so much. I think what's interesting is in, in what all of you said, resistance is not just about opposition. It's not just about opposing something. It's about how do we build something else and how do we like cause transformation. And I think that it'd be, I'd, I'd love to now go into how, how do we do that? How have you all done that in your different work? So um, Eric, just to change the, the order, um, if I could start with you. Um, your work, as you've talked to me about, it focuses a lot on community organizing and building power in communities and against waste colonialism. Um, could you talk to me a bit about what your work has looked like um, and what community organizing is? I keep forgetting to press this thing, so. Um, so, um, I have, um, I work with an organization called the Kenya Environmental Action Network, which is a youth-led organization. And one of our first biggest campaigns uh, was around 2020, when there was news that um, a U.S. company, a U.S. fossil fuel lobby, um, was using a Kenya-U.S. trade deal to export um, plastic waste to Kenya. This is also, bless you, this is also happening in a country where Kenya has um, the strictest, the world's strictest um, plast uh, plastic ban. So this was um, going against the ban and using Kenya. They wanted, uh, I think the messaging was around using Kenya as um, the US, uh, the center of US plastic trade. And uh, which was hypocrisy because um, when plastic waste is exported um, to African countries uh, um, or to Kenya, they don't necessarily end up being being recycled, and that is the same thing with all the plastic. It never ends up being recycled. They end up in landfills. And um, this is not an isolated issue in Kenya specifically, because many global North countries, from the United States to Europe, export plastic waste to global South countries, uh, and they end up in la m massive landfills in global South countries, and that is literally waste colonialism because a lot of the waste that is in global south countries uh, are waste that is did not necessarily come from our very own countries and the waste crisis in kenya breaks down a bit because a lot of the people who are affected uh, are pe people from um, economically disadvantaged backgrounds because um, uh, when waste comes in the landfills are in areas where um, the economically disadvantaged um, neighborhoods are located. Uh, and um, that is um, one of the um, problems where I realized that, you know what, this crisis is literally neo-colonial and uh, waste from the global north shouldn't be ending up in our countries. But this, uh, um, as an activist, I feel like um, a lot of um, the crisis, um, the climate crisis that we are facing is directly linked to neocolonialism because we are facing, uh, gl um, the global south is disproportionately affected by the climate crisis and the, m the people who are bearing the brunt of it had the least role in causing, uh, in causing the crisis. Um, Kenya is facing a severe um, drought. We haven't seen that in like 40 years. Um, and uh, millions are, are facing this crisis and uh, our communities are dying. Um, so we, we had a least role in causing that, that crisis. And at the same time, some of the solutions that are being brought forward are also new colonial in nature. For instance, we, need, we definitely need climate finance to support communities who are affected by the climate crisis. And climate finance that is given so far comes in debt creating forms. That means that global south countries who are receiving this climate finance uh, are paying back to global north countries uh, for a crisis that they did not have 
any role in causing. And that is why climate justice uh, is debt justice, because Global South countries should be, be paying for a crisis they, they had literally no role in causing. And that is why here at COP specifically, we are advocating for climate finance to be um, in form of grants, right? Uh, but it is not only in climate finance, because other solutions, uh, like for instance, um, a carbon offsetting projects where which go um, you know like planting trees in global no south countries most of these trees and plantations that end up being planted end up displacing indigenous communities out of their lands and not respecting indigenous knowledge in protecting their own ecosystems and this is literally um, you know like fortress conservation where indigenous communities are kicked out of their land in the name of conservation uh, and we need to um, acknowledge and realize that indigenous people and human beings are a part of the ecosystem and we live in harmony with nature and indigenous knowledge has existed um, to protect nature for centuries and this is a part of the colonial mindset uh, where people need to be taken out of their lands because they are the problem and we need to realize that um, communities have been living in, uh, in harmony with nature for centuries. And this is not only with, um, clim um, with um, fortress conservation. There are multiple examples I can quote where um, a lot of the, what is marketed as solutions uh, in spaces like this uh, is just neocolonialism. And that is why um, when I think about this, uh, I, it, it reminds me of a quote uh, that says that, all climate justice work is uh, climate work, but not necessarily all climate work is climate justice work. Because a lot of what is marketed as climate work, um, and that is what you see as uh, propagated in spaces like COP uh, as solutions, uh, ends up creating more harm. And that is why we need to root, uh, as activists, uh, we need to root our work uh, in the principles of climate justice, understanding the system that has brought us into this crisis in the first place and realize that some of the solutions that are being um, propagated within this system are actually causing harm and realize that we cannot necessarily be able to bring climate justice uh, if we're not understanding this new colonial system. And that is why even at COP specifically, because we are here at COP27, I think as an activist and being in such a space, uh, we realize that some of the corporate solutions that are being, uh, are being brought here are detached from the realities of uh, the communities who are affected by the climate crisis. And I do not necessarily expect change from a space like COP dominated by global North countries, dominated by neocolonial um, narratives, dominated by corporates um, who are um, you know, creating false solutions, solutions that are creating harm. And we need to look at, um, we need to look at um, change uh, or climate justice beyond a two-week conference uh, and realize that for change to happen, for us to dismantle such systems that brought us into the climate crisis, it takes more than two weeks. It takes more than uh, doing our advocacy around uh, around COP uh, and realize that we need a systematic transformation and we can and these spaces are not uh, are not built uh, for that systematic transformation to take place so what does system change mean to you is a question that you should be asking yourself uh, and see how we can work to, uh, to, to towards that and as an activist uh, I have realized that um, for, for me to be in the climate movement I owe it to the movement and we all owe it to the movement to learn and learn, understand these systems, and work to decolonize, um, um, the, decolonize our own activism by understanding it and um, creating decolonial futures. I feel like that is one, one, of, um, one of the ways that I feel like um, it will contribute uh, to, um, the clim um, for, to climate justice specifically. So um, that, is, uh, that is just um, some of my thoughts. Thank you. That was really helpful framing, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, thank you a lot. And Ray, I wanted to um, ask you, um, because 
you were speaking to me about how you're involved with the court case, so I'd be interested, I think everyone would be interested in hearing a bit more about that, and also the Occupy movement. Um, so if you could speak about how you're using things that are both kind of really kind of outside of the system occupations trying to push things, and then using litigation, which is something that I also used, I also took the UK government to court um, whilst also doing occupation at the same time. So I think, um, yeah, I'd like to hear your perspective on why you've chosen those two different routes. Thank you very much. So what I have been noticing while I have been an activist, I have been an activist for three years now, and what I have noticed is that there is, like inside the youth climate movement, that was like a lack of direct action. And what I mean through that is that sometimes we are doing this big uh, protest that they work, to be civilized, but they are not doing things further for a context on global south countries. For example, in my, my country, Mexico, is, uh, it was the second or first most dangerous place to be a defender. It's like now going like head to head with Colombia and air, air defenders are being like disappearing. For example, right now there, there's an air defender, a woman air defender called in Irma Galindo she has been missing since October from last year, right? And the government doesn't do nothing. And we have this big context in Mexico, and also we have these big, uh, like, indigenous air defender groups, like, uh, I don't know if you guys know about Zapatistas, for example, or the CNI, the Indigenous National Congress, for example, that have organized themselves together and they are putting themselves on front lines. And I think like talking about resistance to power, we have to learn from them because they are resisting since 500 years ago. So that's something I have been learning with my activists. Like, yeah, it's okay to do protests and to be civilized, uh, like the problems on social media and to, yeah, make it visible, make our voice heard. But what do we do back at home? Like, what can we do when, like, at land, at our territories? Because sometimes we think, oh, we are the youth, we can't be territorial defenders because, I don't know, I live in a city. But that is false, is what Eric, Eric was talking, like, a few moments ago, that we are also connected to nature. Like, we are not separated from nature. We are one with nature. Right? So after doing like all this thinking process, we were in, a, in, in my collective, like what can we do uh, to make like real actions that impacts and that breaks the capitalist and colonialist system we are living in? So we thought about Pemex. Pemex is like one of the biggest polluters in the world. In Mexico, there's only one fossil fuel industry that manage all the fossil fuels in Mexico, and that's Pemex, and it's part from the government. I don't know if you guys saw, but there was this uh, big fire on the Pacific Ocean, that it was like literally fire from, uh, from coming from the ocean. That was Pemex's fault. And they not only have done that, but also they have displaced people from the territories. They are damaging local communities, like local uh, people's health is being damaged. They are killing people, right? And we have these many agreements because Mexican government loves to make international agreements, but use it for nothing when they come back home. Like they accept the Paris Agreement, they say it, the Escazú Agreement, but nothing has happened besides that, besides saying, ah, yes, I vote yes. They do nothing back at home. So what we thought is on, on demanding Pemex, like taking them to court to see if there will be reparations in that way. And talking about reparations, I'm not talking about like, oh, like climate finance, give the government money for them to solve the climate crisis. No, like reparation to the people because climate crisis is only going to be solved for the people, by the people. So what we were searching with, what we are searching with this demand is to put people first, right? And make Pemex, that is the polluter, 
make reparations for the people, make land back, for example, and make financial reparations. And having like this, this context, that's why we decide as youth movement, because we have privilege that we are, uh, I am not indigenous, for example, so I have that privilege. And I have a spot because I am part of the youth climate movement, so I have some spot, like with my privilege, like do this at court, even though it's, it's risky, yes, it's risky, but even though it's risky, it's not like that much risk as if I was an indigenous land defender. So with that privilege, took that action. And the Occupy was, is going to be like this big opening of this Pemex campaign. We are with N Fossil Occupy and we are um, like preparing to occupy UNAM, the national like university in Mexico, the public university in Mexico. We are planning to occupy uh, a space there because I also think that resistance is constructing spaces, um, like reappropriating ourselves from the spaces and making community and making mutual aid while we have other actions inside the system. So what the Occupy is gonna be for is for making community, not only for youth community, but also inviting, I don't know, Zapatistas, for example, that we have been in contact with them. Also inviting National Indigenous Congress to also learn from them because we as youth, we have to also sit and listen to the people that have been defending the earth for 500 years because they are the ones with experience. So that's why we always talk about mutual aid as resistance. We always talk about how can we each other support other fights also, like not only the earth fight, but in an intersectional way, like for example, the women's right movement that in Mexico, it's like very, very strong because like, Every day, 10 women are killed in Mexico only for being women. So we have all these, pro, all these like overwhelming things, right? And we have to make solutions to this system because it's the system that is wrong. So we should go out of the system, but also be in the system. And for example, creating spaces in the system, I don't know, like COP, I think it's important, yes but also that this is not like, oh, we are only going like two weeks to go up and that's it. I think we have to really create mutual aid. I think that we really have to unite for each other and stop thinking like individual activism because that's not gonna work. If we are not in communality, if we are not together, like nothing will happen. So uh, that's why we make like these two tactics because in order to change the system, I do think we have to be in the system, but destroying and constructing like uh, love and community inside the system for when we break it and when the revolution came, we have a community because that's what really gonna save us. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I, I love that last point of, of how do we build resistance? Because I think that so often we can act as if it's this like dichotomy between either you work in the system or you work outside the system. Um, but there's this really brilliant concept called non-reformist reform, which is an abolitionist concept that sees that in order to transform the world, like we need to create the conditions for that transformation to be possible. And some of that requires working within the system as well, but of course so much of that is putting pressure from the outside. Um, and that's something that I write about a bit in, in my book. But um, I will now ask Aisha, if that's all right, um, to talk to us a bit about, I, I find your journey really, really interesting. Because I, 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 no, because I think I overheard you having a conversation about how you um, first started to care a lot about climate because of this connection to nature. Um, and how that was really deeply personal. And then you began with um, organizing strikes in New York and then doing Polluters Out, which was a huge and important campaign to kick polluters out of the COP process, out of sponsorship. Um, and now you're like this 
incredible, like galvanizing person who is bringing loads of young people in to try and put pressure within the cop space as well. Um, so I just wanted um, to hear your perspective on like on that journey mm -hmm. and why perhaps now you're like focusing so much on understanding these negotiations um, and why you think that's important for young people. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I could give you guys a little brief, those who don't know. Um, I entered the climate space not because I wanted to necessarily protect the environment, although I think that is a very, very important aspect, and also it is part of my cosmology and the culture I come from. Um, but I was, in addition to protecting the environment, my community was facing the effects of bloodshed for the vital resources that allow the global north to function. And so with my friend Shie, who is in the room, um, and other young people in New York City, we mobilized 500,000 people in the streets of New York in 2019. But that was in 2019. And the movement has gone so much far, further than before, and it has grown larger, but in different increments and different um, areas and nodes. Um, but that said, during the protest, I really thought we were going to change the system. Like, the protest started at 12 a.m. United States time, and it went all over the world in every major city in the world, and young people had left their schools, their school seats were empty, and they were demanding for climate justice, but then the UN assembly happened the day after, and the results of that assembly were patronizing at best. And so it dawned on me that protest comes to an end. You can chant as much as you want. If those chants are not heard by a very particular audience, then you go home. And we were striking, and we were still in the same place. Um, so then we started this group pol called Polluters Out. And that was from a very specific strategy point. Um, and I did this with my friend, Helena Gualinga. She is from the Amazon in rainforest in Ecuador, and Isabella Falahi. And the intention was, what part of this system can we note that is causing the most harm, that has a very specific um, mechanism, solution of change, and who, which stakeholders can we identify immediately and propose a solution to them, and they have it in their power to deliver. And that's where Polluters Out comes into play. And it's a, it, it started as a campaign, it, and it has manifested in many different things now, including the Kick Polluters Out campaign. But what we were proposing was a conflict of interest policy to the UNFCCC, the nations that make up the United Nations and the fossil fuel industry. Because if one follows the money for this conference, for the past 27 years, since 1992, most every single conference has had fossil fuel funding in it. From the tables that you are sitting on right now, in, uh, sitting with, and the chairs you're sitting on, the, the carpets, the ads you see on the walls, this event is curated by the same people who are causing the climate crisis. And isn't it so incredibly odd that we are in the same place, actually we're in a worse place than we started. There's a very specific reason for that. And we discovered this while following the money. But the conflict of interest um, agreement that we were pushing for, it's not like this hasn't been done before. Before the fossil fuel industry was the biggest, most powerful, and climate-destroying industry, um, it had a predecessor called Big Tobacco. And Big Tobacco caused a health crisis of massive scale, um, which I will not get into because that's a lecture of its own. But in the early 90s, the World Health Organization actually signed a conflict of interest agreement with Big Tobacco and 
the governments that are attending this conference, so this very same nation states, and remove big tobacco from the World Health Organization. What that did was change our relationship with cigarettes internationally. That put taxes on cigarettes. That required big tobacco when it was entering conferences like World Health Organization to uh, take accountability for the health crises that they were causing. The same can be done with the fossil fuel industry. It's just that there is no governmental will. And learning the um, UNFCCC system, the COP, it took me time because this is a game. This conference we are attending is a game. The conferences that happened before it is a game and it's a really complicated game and there's a reason why the general public is not made aware of it because if the wording is so complicated and the articles are so complicated, we can't catch up and it's not a leveled playing field. So we're at the conference of parties and a lot of us might be with the assumption that this is where negotiations are happening or with the assumption that this is where change is happening. But actually, if I could give you an analogy, negotiations are decided at the subsidiary briefings in Bonn six months before this conference. That's actually where the game is played, where the ball is kicked and the goals are decided. This is when they reveal the, the scoreboard. And this is when things are officially said yes and no to. It's really unfortunate that we, the general public, the activist community, don't know this. And on top of that, there are everyday developments happening that are so complicated that, again, we can't catch up, including Article 6.4. At the moment, in, cr in addition to loss and damage finance, what is being pitched by the United States is a carbon mechanism that will cause more harm than good. And I I'd love to explain it to you and take this opportunity to explain it to you. So um, the UN is proposing this recommendation in Article 6.4 of the Paris Agreement called removals. And how it works is that the global north nations can actually buy carbon credits to meet their requirements of carbon removal by, for example, a nation like um, the Netherlands. If it has a goal to remove carbon by 40% by 2030, it can remove 20% or put place projects in its country to remove and, and set up a mechanism for 20%, but the other 20%, it will go to the cheapest country that it can find and buy a car, uh, an area of land to start either a project for carbon removal or um, keep preserve that area for carbon removal so the other 20% comes from the global south. And it doesn't actually fulfill its um, commitment to remove 40% because it is going into the global south and buying carbon, um, carbon coin or carbon currency, which puts the global south nations on even a worse playing field because if a country like the Netherlands goes to Colombia and buys a, a part of the rainforest and says we're going to start a carbon removal project here, Colombia cannot say um, Colombia cannot go back to that territory as part of its carbon removal budget or commitment. And those territories are usually territories of indigenous peoples. They're uh, territories that belong to tribal peoples. We get no say to who is bidding on our land. And we're creating a new kind of neoliberalism and this is not made aware to the general public either. So I started trying to learn this, this complex system so that uh, to understand the game because the parties and the governments and the nation states are not just, we're talking about justice here, we're talking about occupation, we're talking about land back. They are so far behind and this 
carbon removal system, the United States wants to call it carbon fin uh, sorry, climate finance. These, these corrupt mechanisms are being called new green project this, new green project that. And we're being sold greenwashing and, and not even aware of it. So I think in order for this, this mechanism, the system to be actually, actually change, we need to understand it. And that's why I've started trying to, to operate within the, the, the way that the parties and the lobbyists do. Because at the end of the day, uh, th those of us who are here, the activists, for every one dollar we have, the corporations and the governments have a hundred. <laughs> for every one lawyer that we have, they have 100. We need more resilience than ever before, but also we need access to the same language so that we can meet them at where they are and challenge them to do better because they still are not taking us seriously. Thank you so much. Um, and everyone, I want to encourage people that the things that you're hearing here, like do something about them, like get your phones out, take videos, post on social media about Article 6.4, to do whatever you can, have conversations about this stuff. It's not just about learning things like good politics is something that we do it's not something that we have um and so with that please do be using also the hashtags that are above um and mitzi i wanted to ask you about your work in the philippines um mitzi and i both wrote a newsletter for the independent together in which mitzi frequently wrote about anti-imperialism and the importance of that to your climate work and the organizing that you do so i wondered if you could speak a bit on that and also on kind of how you got into this work and perhaps how others could get into the same similar work that you're doing as well. I think what all the panelists have said here already has explained kind of how connect, how the climate crisis is connected to the anti-imperialist fight. Um, the way that I got into activism is that I grew up seeing the impacts of the climate crisis on my community, but because of the lack of climate education that's contextualized to our experience, I didn't know that what we were experiencing was the climate crisis. It wasn't all the way until 2017 when I was able to talk to a Lumad indigenous leader, and he told me about how they were being harassed and displaced and militarized and killed. Then ever so simply, he shrugged and chuckled and said, eh, that's why we have no choice but to fight back. And then he talked about lunch. He wasn't trying to convince us. It was as simple as there is no choice but to fight back because this is the planet that we live on. Because we are being oppressed, because we are being harassed, then we have no choice but to fight back. And that is the case for every single person. Of course, on different levels, there, there's a s spectrum of privilege, but really, it also burst my bubble of privilege, realizing that here I was trying to decide whether or not I wanted to be an activist. Who was I to not join the fight of our environmental defenders? And their fight is an anti-imperialist one by nature because they are being bombed by the military. And who is funding the Philippine military, the US military? There's literally taxes of people from the US that goes into to military um, aid in the Philippines. When we talk about climate finance, there's a lot of finance that's pouring from the US to the Philippines as aid, but then neoliberal policies come along with it to get rid of tax subsidies, which who, who suffers from that in the end? The small farmers, the small fisher folk, the indigenous peoples, our environmental defenders, our land defenders. And when talking about imperialism, in the Philippines especially, it's quite difficult because it's a scary word, at least in the Philippines. I don't know how it is in your countries or in your communities, but when you say imperialism in the Philippines, people are like, oh, you're one of those people. Oh, oh, big words, like, oh, you're a leftist. Like, it's, it's a scary thing to say. And we lose people because of that. For the longest time in Yakup, we didn't say, I hope there's no one, whatever. <laughs> we didn't say the words capitalism or imperialism. We would say profit-oriented system. We, we did a step-by-step -step process to explain to our audience what it is. Because once they understood how it looked like, putting a label on it was as easy as just putting it on. And then they realized, ah, that is what it is. 
and sometimes it takes that that slow process and it it also sometimes means that I have different hats when talking to different people and, and sometimes I talk to people about love and, and joy and don't even mention capitalism. And then sometimes I talk to people and it's like anti-imperialism. <laughs> and to me, it's the same thing. But it is that slow process because at the, in the end, we know that people aren't taught to accept these words and the system changing ideas easily. We're not taught to accept this because the system doesn't want us to change it, right? And our education systems, this COP, everything that we're surrounded by is created by the profit-oriented system. That's why we have to continuously work hard to create communities, to create collectives, to create spaces where we battle that actively together, where we hold each other accountable but also hold each other in embrace. And it's a slow and difficult fight, but it starts with listening to the most marginalized people and supporting the national liberation of all colonies, neo-colonies, countries that are experiencing settler colonialism. It starts with that. And it's, it's a long and difficult fight. And it's always such a difficulty for me to say to people, because it's at the same time, we have no more time. The climate crisis is here. But also, I know that this is going to be a long fight. I know that the system isn't going to change just like that. But it is something that will happen because it has happened before. And as long as we keep coming together, uniting, resisting, and turning that resistance to power, title drop, <laughs> then we can do it. It won't happen in these summits. But it will happen because of the things that we're pushing in these summits, slowly. We're building that world together. And to build the world, it takes it step by step, brick by brick. Thank you. And I think that it's going to be the final question from me and like brief answers from everyone. And then we're going to open it up. Um, I'm going to be passing on to the students from Emory. And we're going to be opening up to the audience if people have questions to so start thinking of your questions. Um, but I wanted to ask, so everyone if you could just think of what is one thing that you like wish you'd known when you started this work that would have helped you get into it or start doing the work that you're doing now so that the people who are sitting here can be like I'm going to be inspired I'm going to go and do something I'm going to do whatever you guys are doing or, or whatever else they want to do do you want to start do you want to start <laughs> Yeah, it's like I'm 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 translating <laughs> like from from Spanish to English, so and I speak very fast, so <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I am I am thinking my my answer, but I think well, I think I would like to to tell like I, young activists, a person that are starting like activism that wish I had known, is that it's very important to have a collective. Like, it is important that our fights are not individual fights. It is very important to Im be involved in the fights on your territories. I think that will be, like, the main thing. It is important to maintain contact with those who have been resisting since 500 years ago. Even though you look at them and they, you are like, no, they will never, like, turn, turn their head to teach me teach me or talk to me or lead me in their spaces. They do. We just have to be there and be interesting uh, because we need community, we need communality, we need mutual aid, and that's the only way we ca will can change the system. Yeah. Eric. Oh. What is one thing that I wish I would have known? Um, one thing is um, I entered into the climate movement with so much anger uh, and need to create change. And one thing that I wish I would have known is that change doesn't happen for <laughs> six years and change has been happening over time. And uh, with so much anger, I expected, you know what, we're going to do this. Let's change it this way. Why aren't you? And it created like um, a lot of burnout in me, you know, because with su such being in such spaces like COP27, right, it's so overwhelming because 
if the world leaders really did want to create change, like within these two weeks, they can. But it's bigger than that. It's because of systems that have been, in, been built for years. And it, it, understanding these systems uh, is what brought me to understand that, OK, that's not how it works. It doesn't work, pop, you know? We need to put a lot of work in it and uh, you know, work for it for years, you know? So th that, um, when I joined the movement, it's, it's led me, uh, me to have like, a lot of burnout as a result, uh, thinking that it would happen like, immediately or like, you know, instant. Another thing that I wish I would have known uh, is uh, the friends that I have um, in the movement. Because being in a movement is about being in a, being in a community, working to build change together. And I, I'm so grateful for the friends and the community that I have been able to, um, to build. And why, did I know, why, why didn't I know these people earlier, you know? Yeah, life would have been so great, yeah. Thank you. Mitzi. I had the incredible privilege to be mentored by a lot of amazing liberation and environmental defender activists. So at the beginning, they taught me quite a lot. So I'll say that first, because um, I was so apathetic when I started. That's why I'm also really patient with people, because I was a horrible person before I was an activist, honestly. Um, but they taught me from the masses to the masses. And that means that everything we do is we have to learn from the people on the ground, from the communities take that with us and whatever we learn, we bring it back to them. It's a two-way exchange of learning and education and growth and community building. And something that I wish I knew in the beginning was it's okay to fail and it will happen. And sometimes you have to, to be able to learn, to be able to grow as a movement. Sometimes you have to let things go and just assess later on what happened so that you can grow as a community. You don't have to do everything like, oh, this person didn't do this thing. I have to do it now. No, just let it happen. And that's OK, because we're organizing something. We're doing something together collectively. And if we want people to learn, we need to be able to give some things up. And that's what I had to learn <laughs> multiple times in a very difficult journey. But that it's, it's OK to fail. But we won't be failing the big fight. It's okay to fail in these small things, but in the end, we know it'll be there so that we can win the better world that we're fighting for. And finally, Aisha. <laughs> um, so I have advice for, for activists and then for young tribal or native or aboriginal women because for the longest, um, I, I wanted that. Um, so for just general activists, I was under the impression that we had to save the world um, when I first started this. I was under the impression that that was a part of my responsibility as well because that's what world leaders kept telling us, but also that's what we kept being applauded for. And it took a few years for me to realize that I, I don't have to save the entire world. We don't have to save the entire world. And that my world is incredibly small. My world is my community, where the two rivers meet at the, Indus, uh, at the ancient Indus Valley. My world is my family, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins. And that is my world, because if any part of it is destroyed or is in pain, my world falls apart. It comes to an end. And my responsibility is to that. And if we can all take care of our little corners of the world, then collectively we can protect the environment. Then collectively we can save the world. But it is unfair and it is, it's too much to take it on all. And then for young um, women, um, I moved to the US at the age of eight. I was plucked off of my tribal lands where my ancestors are. My ancestors' blood is mixed with that soil and that hurt a lot. And it was difficult and I wished my grandmother was there. I wished my aunts were there. I wish I had the matriarchs I had growing up to ask for advice because I didn't have that. And I was looking for it for, for 
um, in every aspect of my activism. And my advice to, to those of us who come from a very innate connection to the land is trust yourself. You are at this time on this path for a very reason. And in all of our collective cosmologies, we understand that the earth is a living being, that she is a conscious being, and she is very consciously given you this responsibility to protect her. And for you to protect her, whether you are from the Americas or Asia or Africa, the way that you can connect to your ancestors, the way that you can connect to your innate responsibility, the way that you can connect to the earth is, is by listening to her because she speaks. And she will tell you how to protect her and she will tell you how, 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 how to be her guardian. Thank you all so much for like spending this time with us um, and for this conversation. And I know there's so much like other genius in this room, so I really hope that people will pr add contributions um, as the session continues. Um, I wanted to add my small, tiny advice um, that I wish I'd had at the start is I wish I think I'd known that challenging things is less scary when you have people around you who will support you and hold you. Um, and as Ray and many other people have said, we don't do this work alone, so find a group, find a community. It will be so much easier that way. Like, neoliberalism and capitalism says this lie that, like, throughout history or presently, success or um, grand transformation comes from exceptional individuals, but in reality, it only comes from bu a bunch of people who've come together who are very ordinary and wonderful at the same time, um, and that all of us here are ordinary and wonderful at the same time, and we can create a better future, we can transform the world. Um, so thank you all for listening. <laughs> and we're now gonna have a Q&A led by the Emory students. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to our panelists. Um, I learned so much today, so I really appreciate that. It's wonderful to see so many young people at COP and so many people in the seats today. Um, in the interest of time, we do want to move on to the networking session so that you all can share your stories, but we really highly encourage you all to ask the panelists your questions, tweet, Instagram, um, and then talk to them outside after the conference. And my friend Prachi now will explain how the networking session will move forward. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so thank you so much to the panelists. And I think this is an amazing opportunity for everyone here to start building more connections to grow this movement. And so we were thinking about having a networking session. So the idea here is to form five big groups, and we invite our panelists to join each of these groups. Um, and we're going to pose a new question every five minutes for about three questions um, and invite all of you to share your experiences, share your stories, um, and get to know each other. So if everyone wants to get up, <laughs> get a little bit movement back into your bodies and kind of come together, come closer to the stage. Yeah, um, if our panelists could spread out, so we have two in the front corners and two in the back corners and one in the middle, that would be amazing. Cool. Cool. So Eric is going to be up here in the corner next to the podium. Um, Mitzi. Yeah. Huh? 
Mitzi, where are you going to be? Okay. All right, Mitzi is going to be up in the front center. And then Michaela is in the other corner up in the front, as well as Aisha. Cool. So our first question is going to be, what do you think are barriers to participation in climate action for youth? Um, and have you witnessed or personally experienced any of these? If you're having trouble finding a group, feel free to come up to the front and we can direct you to the person you're interested in chatting with. Is that better? I accidentally skipped the slide, so we'll go back to round one after this. Sorry about that. <laughs>
Okay, we're gonna move on to our next question. In the interest of time, we're just gonna do our last question, which is how can youth power and formally power work together on climate action? Sorry, youth power and formal power.
Okay. Thank you, everybody.